The United States, the world's first nuclear power, got its hands on nukes 79 long years ago, and for 62 of those years, the venerable Minuteman ICBM, an ICBM being a missile with a range of greater than 3,400 miles, has been a vital keystone of its nuclear arsenal, always ready to take flight at a moment's notice and reduce an enemy city, or three, to a sheet of atomic glass in a mere 30 minutes. If you happen to be thinking that that's a really, really long time for a single ICBM to be in service, oh well, you'd absolutely be right. So what gives? How on earth has it managed to remain in service for so long? And what does the future hold for this missile, which is only four years away from being old enough to claim social security? Well, don't switch over to another video, because those questions and more should be answered in the next 20 minutes or so. So let's go. The development of the Minuteman began in the mid to late 1950s, when the Soviets were really starting to pull ahead with their missiles and the US needed something a bit special to level the playing field. For reference, the US offerings around this time consisted of things like their first ICBM, the SM-65 Atlas from 1959, which despite having a yield of up to 3.75 megatons and a range of 9,000 miles, was not liked due to the fact that it had to be fueled up before launch and thus its response time was severely hampered, plus the fact that it was genuinely quite crude and temperamental thing. They also had the LGM 25C Titan II, which entered service in 1962, had a slightly lesser range of 8,700 miles, a much bigger 9 megaton warhead, and was generally far better made, but like the Atlas, it had to be fueled before launch, and thus would have proved to be a tad slow to get off the ground had the Cold War ever gone hot. Their need to be filled up immediately before launch was due to the fact that they used liquid-fueled engines. There's many reasons why liquid fuel isn't an ideal choice for ICBMs, but the one we're really interested in is the fact that liquid fuel has a limited shelf life and will eventually separate over time, or which is why the Atlas and Titan had to be fueled up before launch, because if they just left them in the silos with the go juice already brimming in the tanks, there's a good chance that the missile would just fail, either in the silo or up in orbit as the degraded fuel wouldn't combust properly and thus cause all manner of issues. And so, the use of solid fuel propellants became the foundational demand of what would become the Minuteman. Then, it would be able to sit in its silos for decades at a time and be ready to go at a minute's notice, just like the Revolutionary War era militia, which it was named after. Many, many wrinkly brains would lend their grey matter to the development, but one who undoubtedly contributed more than any other was Colonel Edward Hall, as it was he that spearheaded the effort in figuring out the technical nitty-gritty of its solid fuel engines. His work led to the development of the Minuteman One, which first entered service in October 1962 at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. Production and delivery continued for a few more years, and eventually the missiles would be spread across six Air Force bases located across the central and northern Great Plains, with the others being Ellsworth in South Dakota, Minot, North Dakota, Whiteman in Missouri, F.E. in Wyoming, and Grand Forks in North Dakota. This dispersion was very intentional, as it made them both harder to take out in a single salvo if the Soviets were to attempt a first strike, as well as being relatively removed from populated urban centers in order to minimize civilian casualties in the event of said attack. But of course, lethality was not sacrificed for either of these things, which were side bonuses in US defense strategy, and so every single site was still very much in the range of the Soviet heartland. So then. The job, to many at least, was a good one. The US had got its first proper, as in fully capable, ICBM that could go on to form the ever so precious land component of its nuclear triad, alongside their submarines under the waves and their bombers in the sky. But still, some in the US defense establishment weren't satisfied, seeing the Minuteman I as a flawed diamond in need of some polish rather than a be all and end all wonder weapon. And so, work on an even better model began before the final Minuteman I had even been delivered. And so, the Minuteman II entered service in 1965. As for what its improvements were, we'll hold that thought because we're focusing on the story side of the missile at present and we'll come back to the techie stuff later on in its own dedicated chapter. So look forward to that. But do know this, those improvements were so well received that all 800 Minutemen 1s began to be pulled from service in June of that same year, with the final one finally being withdrawn in 1969. 
Many of them were spared from the scrap man's cutting torch, however, because while they had become militarily redundant, they were still damn handy bits of kit, and so many found new leases of life in various research and testing roles, with one particularly interesting example being one which was launched from a C-5 galaxy in 1974 in order to explore the feasibility of an airbase launch system for the upcoming LGM-118 Peacekeeper ICBM. Ultimately, the Thousand Minuteman 2s were produced over the four-year production run, and then the exact same thing happened again. Air Force bigwigs beheld the Minuteman 2 and still found its shine to be lacking in luster, and so the Minuteman 3, the most advanced model of all, was introduced in 1970. Its younger sibling held on for a while, however, with Minuteman 2s remaining in service until June 1992, as while not perfect, they were deemed perfectly capable of doing the job as long as they were supplemented by more advanced missiles. It took until 1995 for all of them to be disposed of, at which point the Minuteman 3 became the only variant remaining in service, a state of affairs that persists to this very day, with give or take 450 of them still being in the US inventory. So now that we know the story, let's move on and have a look at the technical nitty-gritty of these deathly terrifying machines. Now let us begin, naturally, with the Minuteman 1. We have already discussed its solid fuel propulsion system at some length, so we don't need to retread old water with that, but we will say that it weighed give or take 65,000 pounds, stood at an inch short of 56 feet, and was 5 feet 6 inches wide at its broadest point. Now that number soup is all well and good if we do say so ourselves, but what we really need to do is add some real world meaning to it all, and to do so, let us compare it to the rocket that all of you are most likely to be familiar with, thanks to it being in an ungodly number of museums worldwide, and that's the Nazi V2 rocket. In comparison, the V2 weighs approximately 28,000 pounds. Call it twice and a bit longer than the Minuteman 1, just for the sake of having a nice and simple difference that your brain can easily work with. As for the height, the V2 stood an inch off 46 feet. As for the width, there's only one inch in it, with the V2 being 5 feet 5 inches wide, so no need for any comparisons there. We're sure you will have no issues at all picturing how big that is. Now we have to admit that we've done something a little cheeky here because what we just discussed wasn't entirely in aid of allowing you to picture how big a Minuteman 1 is in your minds, although that was certainly part of it. It was also a cheeky segue into a fact that we really want to push deep into your brains, the absurd speed with which rocket technology improved in that period. The V-2 took its first flight in 1942, and the Minuteman 1 came only 19 years later in 1961, and in that time, for the sake of being a little over twice as heavy, only a touch taller, and near as damn it the exact same width, the missile had gone from something that could hit a maximum speed of 3,580 miles per hour to something that could top out at 17,500 mph, albeit in very different ways because the V-2 was a single-stage rocket, i.e. one that flew directly to its target and went bang, whereas the Minuteman one was a three-stage rocket, i.e. one that has multiple fuel tanks and motors, each of which is shedded upon a scent to reveal another engine that's more efficient in those atmospheric conditions. This continues until you're just left essentially with a warhead in space ready to be propelled down to the ground at insane speeds. But still, the ludicrous leap in tech must be recognized. Then there's the difference in lethality. 2,200 pounds of old-fashioned explosives were in the nose of a V-2, compared to the W-59 nuclear warhead of the Minuteman 1, which detonated with a yield equivalent to 800 kilotons of TNT, which, to you do the math, means is about 802,000 times larger. As for the later variants of the Minuteman, we won't stress too much about the physical dimensions of them specifically, as they are near as damn it the same anyway. Instead, let's have a look at their improvements and changes to their specifications. For the Minuteman 2, its lead improvement was to its inertial guidance system, which made it accurate to a degree of 1.2 miles originally, and later a mere 0.7 miles, and that's compared to 1.5 miles in the original Minuteman 1. The range also improved with a healthy raise to 6,300 miles. Speed remained more or less the same, however. For firepower, each carried a 1,200 kiloton W-56 nuclear warhead, which, if you're wondering, because oh, we've done the maths again, is 1.2 million times larger than the warhead of a V-2. It is with the Miniman 3, however, that things get really interesting, as it was a so-called multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle type missile, i.e. it had more than one missile on top, and when it reached orbit, it shot them all out to different targets at the same time. 
The specific types have changed, what with the Minuteman 3 having been in service for so long, with it starting out with up to 370 kiloton W62 warheads before moving on to 350 kiloton W78s, and then finally, for some, as the upgrade still being rolled out, a 300 kiloton W87 warhead. Range and accuracy also improved once again, with the Miniman 3 able to travel for up to 8,700 miles and land with an accuracy of 240 meters. But while the Minuteman, in one form or another, may have served the US dutifully for over 60 years now, all good things must come to an end. There will come a time when, for a myriad of reasons, be they technological, economic, or logistical, the Minuteman simply will no longer be practical as a weapon system. And actually, according to a report by the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments released in 2018 titled Sustaining the US Nuclear Deterrent, that time is rapidly approaching. Allow us to summarize this report's conclusion for you now. In a nutshell, it begins by stating that even the newest Minuteman 3s are old, with the first ones already having entered service all the way back in 1970, and as we learned earlier, they were only designed for a 10-year service life. It then goes on to clarify this point, however, by saying that despite their age, until relatively recently, all was well, and the arsenal was kept at near as damn it full operational capacity without any major issues, thanks to extensive and regular modernization and life extension programs. The report goes on to further clarify that, until relatively recently part, by explaining that the missile's reliability is rapidly eroding due to aging components that are starting to wear out and fail, and simply cannot be replaced, either because there are no spare parts to replace them, and trying to source them nowadays would be a monumentally expensive pain in the ass, or because the design of the Minuteman simply doesn't allow them to be replaced, period. As for specific examples of such components, the report points to things like the gyroscopes and guidance systems, which it claims cannot be refurbished at all and have long since had their spare parts stockpiles dry up. It also points to the propellants, which will begin to deteriorate to the point of non-functionality in the late 2020s, as even solid fuel has an eventual use-by date, and what's worse, it cannot simply be brimmed up like one would a car. The solid fuel is built into the rocket as though it were a component, and thus it is a real pain in the ass to change it. But it gets even worse, because not only is changing an absolute nightmare, but it's also a nightmare the rocket fuel can only endure once with certainty, and maybe twice if you are lucky, and all Minuteman 3s have already had both their first and second stages washed out and repaired once before. As for the third stage, because it's made out of a specific and still seemingly classified composite, it cannot survive being washed out even once, and would instead need to be fully replaced. To put it bluntly, in the coming years, the Minuteman arsenal is absolutely f***ed. This then raises a question. If the US wishes to maintain its position as a preeminent nuclear power, what needs to be done? They could, of course, bite the bullet, scoop up container ships worth of taxpayer cash, and throw it at the Minuteman so that they can receive a full nut and bolt modernization that would see every single component of every single missile checked over and pulled out to be refurbished if it was viable to do so, or fully replaced with a fresh part if it was not. But why bother doing that with a missile which, and there's no two ways about putting this, well, be simply obsolete? One major issue is with the guidance system. This has already been upgraded before, with the Guidance Replacement Program, which was initiated in 1993, and saw all missiles in inventory having their older NS-20 guidance sets replaced with newer NS-50 sets manufactured by Rockwell International. This, for complicated technical reasons that we don't need to worry about, was a fair improvement over the NS-20, which itself was an improvement over the even older NS-17 and NS-10 of earlier Minutemen, but it is far from perfect. It needs sporadic software adjustments to stay accurate, thanks to the occasional bit of bungled code that gets discovered, and also it's depending upon inertial navigation properties, i.e. knowing where it started, and then using measured changes in speed, angle, and altitude to figure out where it now is, a system which is susceptible to cumulative errors over time and can only be corrected with external input. Then there are the issues with its re-entry vehicles, which do not have terminal guidance systems, i.e. a guidance system that can steer and guide them after they have separated from the main stage of the missile. Instead, they simply follow a ballistic arc akin to an artillery shell. This naturally isn't ideal, because should said arc be messed up in orbit, that's it. Your missile is going where it's going, end of discussion. 
It should be stressed, however, that this tech, which is very common on smaller missiles – think AA missiles or even short and medium-range ballistic missiles – has typically not been incorporated into any nation's ICBMs historically, but that's rumored to change with Russia's new RS-28. Also to note is the Minuteman's vulnerability to integrated air defense systems, cyber threats, and electronic warfare capabilities. These modern defense mechanisms are designed to disrupt or destroy incoming missiles, and the Minutemen, initially conceived as it was in the late 1950s and early 1960s, simply is not equipped to deal with them. So bad is this situation that in the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review, a document commissioned by then-President Trump to look into and fully assess the U.S.'s nuclear capabilities, simply says, quote, the Miniman 3 will have increasing difficulty penetrating future adversary defenses. Just with these issues we've chosen to highlight, and believe us, there are more, it's fair to say that the Minuteman needs quite a bit of work to remain competitive going forwards, and that brings us back to our earlier point. The cost of actually doing all of that work, which in the Air Force's opinion simply isn't worth it to keep a 60-year-old missile going a touch longer. Instead, they've reasoned that those resources would be better spent developing a brand new top-of-the-line ICBM that, touch wood, can be fully developed, delivered on, and deployed, ready for when the Minuteman start well and truly falling apart towards the end of the decade. And this is what has been chosen to pick up the mantle. The LGM-35 Sentinel, formerly known as the ground-based strategic deterrent prior to its formal designating. It's part of a broader $1.5 trillion nuclear weapons modernization effort, and no, you didn't mishear us there, we did say trillion with a T, i.e. a little less and a little more than the entire GDPs of Spain and Indonesia, respectively. Just to give you an idea, beyond just the adoption of the Sentinel, the effort will also see the replacement of the Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines with the new Columbia-class, the introduction of the B-21 Raider Stealth Bomber, which will replace the aging B-2, life extension programs for existing warheads such as the B-61 Gravity Bomb and the W-88 Warhead, and the introduction of new warheads like the W-87-1, and so on and so forth. As for the Sentinel itself, however, its range will be in excess of 3,400 miles, the minimum threshold needed for a missile to qualify as an ICBM, but also not an exact figure, as it appears at the time of writing. This hasn't been disclosed yet. If you want to take a ballpark figure taken purely from our gut, however, call it 9,500 miles or so, we reckon. More than the Minuteman 3, for which it obviously has to be to be an upgrade, but more crucially, in the same kind of ballpark as missiles like the Russian R-36M or the Chinese DF-41, which both have a range in that short area and are among the furthest flying missiles out there. But while range may remain elusive, we do know what will be bolted to the top of it courtesy of a 2019 press release by the National Nuclear Security Administration. The w 87 we just mentioned, which is improved in a number of ultra-techy ways we don't need to worry about as compared to its standard forerunner, and will supposedly pack a punch of 475 kilotons. What we don't know, however, is how many of them it will carry, as summed up by the Congressional Research Service in a March 2024 defense primer quoting here, the Air Force plan to deploy the Sentinel with one warhead per missile. However, they could potentially instead deploy two or three warheads in a multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle configuration. Again, if you want our gut instinct, it'll almost certainly be a MERV, if for no other reason than we doubt that National Ego would allow the US to go back to a standard single banger type, given that the Minuteman was the first ever missile to deploy the technology. We also know that the Sentinel will feature modular open system architecture in its design, which is all about allowing its parts to be swapped out and changed relatively easily during its lifespan. The reason for this is obvious. Keeping the Miniman up to date proved to be such a pain in the ass that they'd like to avoid a repeat of that in the future. Given that the Air Force expects the Sentinel to remain in service until at least 2075, such a move in its design is certainly a big and clever idea. For its motors, we know that it will be a three-stage design and use solid fuel in all of them. Testing of these is underway as we speak, with the first stage having undergone a full-scale static test fire in March 2023, with the second stage following it in January 2024. As for when we can expect to see it reach service, the current time frame has the Sentinel reaching initial operational capability by 2029, with a full operational capability of 400 missiles expected to be achieved in 2036. Included in this time frame is the decommissioning of the Minutemans, which the Air Force is currently vague on when it comes to specifics, with most releases on the matter saying words to the extent of they'll start going out when the Sentinels start coming in. And the cost of it all, you ask? 
At present, it's estimated to be about $95.8 billion of that $1.5 trillion total modernization budget. And they better be praying that it doesn't become another endless delayed defense project, because as we have seen, given the state of the Minutemen arsenal, they have left it a bit down to the wire with this one.